Support for this show comes from Lead Quizzes. Lead Quizzes helps you easily set up high converting quizzes to capture and qualify leads for your business. Visit leadquizzes.com slash podcast to get a 14-day free trial today. We had no money to pay our mortgage. And we were just like, we were personal trainers. We just started with nothing, you know, no idea how we're going to pay our mortgage. It was like three days before we had to pay it. And we drove around, it's totally illegal, so don't do this. But we drove around to one of the richest neighborhoods in Connecticut and started putting flyers in everyone's mailboxes. It's illegal, but you know, whatever, putting the flyers in. And we did 400 of them. You know, we probably spent, you know, $400 in gas, right? And we got zero response from those letters. From Lead Quizzes, it's Journey to Seven Figures, a show about entrepreneurs and the stories behind how they grew their business to seven figures and beyond. We cover the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the lessons they learned along the way. I'm Jeremy Ellens, and this is episode number six. On today's show, I interview my friend Kevin Gianni. Kevin started as a personal trainer, became a health blogger, and launched a multi-million dollar skincare line that is on an eight-figure run rate. This is an extraordinary episode with some really actionable strategies. Let's jump in. All right, welcome back to Journey to Seven Figures. I'm very excited today to introduce you guys to my guest today, Kevin Gianni. Started a company called Anne Marie Skincare. They're on an eight-figure run rate right now. He hit a million dollars within three years of starting. Before that, he had another seven-figure business, which we're going to get into today as well, called Renegade Health, and how he built that and transitioned into Anne Marie Skincare. What they do is they provide natural, organic, wild-crafted skincare, makeup, essential oils. They've been a client of Lead Quizzes before. Their products are great. We've bought it. Our customers have bought it. So really excited to introduce you today to Kevin and jump into your journey to seven figures. Welcome. What's up, Jeremy? I'm glad to be here, man. Awesome. Me too. Cool. So let's take it back to the beginning. Like, how did you come up with the idea for Renegade Health? Well, we were personal trainers in Connecticut at the time and, you know, had a real love for fitness. And then I got a book called Ultra Wellness, which is a book by Mark Hyman and, and Mark Laponis. And that kind of changed the whole way that we started doing fitness, really. We would kind of go into the client's house under the guise of like getting them in shape in terms of fitness you know, like the workouts and all that sort of <laughs> stuff. And then we'd slip in some of this ultra wellness stuff. <laughs> and some of them got it and some of them like dug it. And some of them were just like, I don't know, I just want to do some plank or something like that. <laughs> Who wants, no one wants to do plank. That's a, that's a bad one. So, so that kind of started my interest in kind of expanding what we were doing. What is the ultra wellness? It's a book. It's just a book by Mark Hyman and Mark Laponis. It's one of Mark's first books. You know, and you can go through the progression of Dr. Mark Hyman. He's, you know, kind of a, he's a hero of mine. We'll add that in the show notes for guests. But yeah, like, I mean, what was different about it that you're teaching to these people as personal trainers? You know, what's crazy. It's like everything that is normal now in terms of functional medicine, Mm -hmm. but then it was just ridiculous. You know what I mean? It was was to the point where like, it's like, you know, just take vitamin C and alpha lipoic acid and like, you know, vitamin D and like all the, just like supplements, really. I mean, that was kind of, the main thrust of it, but the approach to medicine was so much different. And obviously we weren't medical doctors or anything like that, but we could always recommend a book or suggest some of the foods, you know, that people could eat to actually lose weight and get results. So what happened is that I got turned on to a guy named Ryan Lee. Some people who are listeners may know who he is. At that time, he had a website called Sports Specific and Personal Trainer U. And so I got hooked up with a group of personal trainers in Personal Trainer U. I think it was like a nine dollar a month membership site that Ryan was running. And, you know, it's crazy. Some of the guys that were in that group were Mike Geary, who has ran six pack abs a while ago, but, you know, now has diversified into, you know, his own kind of online empire and just a whole bunch of other people in that group that kind of influenced some of the things we were doing. And the main thing was like, start a membership site, you know, and that was like the thing you have to start a membership site. And so we did. And the membership site was called liveawesome.com. I don't know if it exists anymore. I mean, if you type it in, you might not, you might not get anything. I spent like five, six thousand dollars to get it developed. It was on a platform called Membergate. I don't even know if it's around anymore, and it failed. It just, <laughs> it just completely failed. <laughs> and not, to, not anyone's fault, but mine. And as I was working on it, what I did was Anne Marie, my wife. And I, we were both training clients. I just gave all of my clients to her, just essentially put all my eggs in one basket. This membership site is going to you know, change the world. Everyone's going to want to sign up for $9. And man, I don't even know if we got like 
30 signups total over the, <laughs> over the lifetime of it. Brutal. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess, but it was, <laughs> it was a brutal lesson, but you know, and there were times when Anne-Marie would look at me and the, through our bedrooms were like, so the office and bedroom was like right across the hall and the bathroom was, you know, on the other wall there. And she would be like lying in bed, reading a book. And she'd just look at me. She could see me through the two doors on my computer. She's like, what are you doing in there? Like she just didn't, <laughs> she had no idea what was happening. It could have been 12 o'clock at night. So after that failure, I think the success of that thing where we still weren't making much money online, we're, you know, again, obviously if we have 30 members at $9 a month and then with a, you know, a, a stick rate of like a month and a half, <laughs> you can kind of tell what that, what that looks like. I started interviewing people and the good news is that interviewing people on liveawesome.com or just because of the fact that it was a nicely built Membergate site, people were actually interested in being interviewed for public content. And I started to kind of create a little bit of network of people. You know, I didn't go out and try to interview, you know, Mark Hyman at first, but I just kind of went into these little, you know, this is when message boards were like, you know, live and happening. And, you know, so I would just go and see who was commenting and I would say, Hey, you know, you want to be interviewed for liveawesome.com? Sure. Of course. You know, could you send it out to your list and tell them about what we're doing over here? Sure. And personal trainer, you, I asked some of the fitness coaches there that were doing some good things and they were always willing. So it was a nice way to start to kind of build a community that now I know, and a lot of them are my friends. Hmm. So what was your goal then like with going out and interviewing and building this community and this content? Did you see this vision of, I want to build this site with a lot of traffic or what were you thinking back then? You know, I wish I could go back in a time machine and get into my brain at that point. I was very evangelical about natural health at that point. That's when I had really, really gotten into this whole world. And to the point where I was experimenting with different diets, I had gone into veganism, raw food, all that sort of stuff. So I really was the preacher, you know what I mean? Like that's, <laughs> I wanted an audience for that. And that was my goal just to get it out there. It wasn't necessarily a ton of money. It was more just like, I can't believe that people don't know this stuff. Mm -hmm. And that was my whole thing. I was indoctrinated, I guess. <laughs> Very cool. So you're creating this content. It was, did you keep the $9 a month membership site going? And is that where you're putting the content or was this something new? Well, so what happened was I stopped the membership site and I just let it sit there and I just canceled everyone and said, Hey, we're not going to do this anymore. And I was at an event, a Ryan Lee event, and I was talking to the people who were there and they were explaining to me that, that I should do some sort of teleseminar. And so I was like, well, tell me about that. What does that look like? And essentially what they were doing, they were doing a, you know, a teleseminar call once a month to their audience. And this is kind of the, like from the Alex Mendozian school of internet marketing where, you know, you tell a seminar, you sell their product in the back end, you get an affiliate commission. And that was what they were doing. And I was like, oh, that sounds pretty cool. But I was like, I've kind of been doing these anyway for free. You know what I mean? Like it's, this is kind of what we've been doing. And so I got on the phone with my friend, Nick Ortner, who runs uh, the tapping solution.com. And we kind of decided that we wanted to, I guess, revolutionize that particular model. And what we come up, what we came up with is something that's very popular these days, which is the World Summit. We actually came up with the first World Summit that I think was ever done was the Fountain of Youth World Summit, which was our model. I remember sitting on the phone with him and talking about, what are we going to call it? And we're just like, oh, we should call it an event or a conference. I'm like, no, it's not a conference. And he's like, why don't we call it a summit? I'm like, oh, that sounds great. And I was like, why don't we call it a world summit? And we're like, yeah, that sounds really good. And so the whole model, of which many people know now is you get to listen to a call a night or two calls a night or 10 calls a night, depending how many people you, you know, get on board and you play that for, well, at least the way we did it was you play it for free for 24 hours. And then if you wanted the whole package, you could get the calls you know, for a reasonable price. And that kind of started the list building for us. The Fountain of Youth World Summit, we thought that we were going to make millions. You know, we had a big affiliate that was going to send out, we went to San Diego because we had another meeting and we're, we're in Pacific Beach and we're like, should we get the hotel room that's like facing the street or should we get the one by the ocean? We're like, nah, let's get the one facing the ocean. You know, this big guy is going to promote tomorrow. You know, should we eat out tonight or like, you know, just get some snacks from the co-op? Like, nah, let's eat out tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it's a world summit. I just the world summit, man. You know, everyone's going to show up. Email went out the next day and I think over a period of like three days, we got about 1500 bucks from it. Mm. Uh, <laughs> we're just like, oops, <laughs> probably didn't even pay for the hotel room <laughs> and the dinner. But in all from that, I think we built 
about a 15,000 person list. And we, I mean, we probably made 15,000 bucks, you know? Yeah. To summarize real quick and we'll jump back in. Mm -hmm. Like what you mean with these summits is you're going out and interviewing like a bunch of summits. Is it like, or not summit speakers. So like you interview like 10 different people and then you get those people to promote this summit that they're like playing. And then if people like opt in to watch it and then they can buy a product at the end or all the recordings. That's correct. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. 15,000 people and maybe $15,000 in revenue. Yeah. Yeah. Which, okay. which in today's standard, I mean, it depends on, you know, the big guys are making a lot more money on that, uh, than, than that. But, but even for a small person, I still think it's a great model to start a business for sure. Okay, cool. So what happened next? <laughs> what happened next is we just did more, <laughs> you know, we, we did, we did more and more summits and we did summits on raw food. We did, you know, more general summits. I did a few cancer summits. Nick and I separated and, and he did the tapping world summit, which I think has been this may be the 10th year of that. Mm. So, you know, that's a legacy kind of product that they do every year. It's worked every year since the beginning. And so, I mean, it, it does have legs if you do it right. And I think that that's the, you know, a lot of people just try to try to cobble together a lot of people who can send out a lot of emails, but it has to have a nice theme. It has to have something that's very niche and it has something that, that someone can take away and they actually want to listen to it again. And the problem now is that because of the prevalence of podcasts, that it doesn't necessarily have the same the same value. So, you know, you Mm. have to think about what can you, you can do to make it more valuable than, you know, what it was before it has to evolve. Yeah. So yeah, so we did more summits. I started writing some books, self-publishing books, which was fun. I bought some Dan Pointer books, which you can, you know, find on Amazon. He's, you know, I would say probably at least back in the day, he's one of the the biggest self-publishing, you know, gurus. And so we just did that kind of route instead of going through a publisher. And then we opened up a store on our blog because we had built a list and people were asking us questions about things. And we went out and we were in an RV for two and a half years, traveling around the country, interviewing experts. So, I mean, really, we, we kept that interview kind of theme, whether it was free content interviews, whether it was summit interviews, or it was YouTube video interviews, which is kind of what we evolved into after one of the first or second summits. And we were on the road, we, we did like 900 videos on YouTube and mm. kind of way before, I mean, I wish I had done it now because you know, I think that now it's, you know, so many more people who are, who are hip to it, you know, we probably would have been more successful, but I'm happy it happened the way that it did. But we still kept that interview format. And then we built a store and started to source different unique products from all different places. We sourced a cinnamon from Costa Rica. We, we sourced holy basil. We sourced a mint, an Indian mint, Munya from Peru. And so we had a lot of fun with that and just telling stories about it and, and selling really good, high quality, organic products. Yeah. Mm, interesting. How big was like your list and like how much traffic were you getting like at that point when you launched the store? Well, when we launched it, our list was probably about 60 or 70, 80 K somewhere around there. In terms of traffic, Renegade never really cracked just maybe a guess or so, but it never really cracked more than like 5,000 people a day or 6,000. It kind of just like, it would stick at that level. And the skincare business was the same until we, we did some SEO stuff, but yeah, it kind of stayed the same. And the list was, was loyal. Like and the people, we love the people. I mean, it was just great to go around and meet them too, but we really kind of stayed internal using some of the summits to build up the list, but we didn't do any like year long list building type things. It was, it was very much so like launch, build trust, and then just send emails, send content, emails with content, and then with offers. And that was really kind of how we just kind of generated the revenue for that business. That was model. Cool. Well, I mean, you kind of downplay a little bit, like five to 6,000 visits a day, but that's like 150,000 people a month if I'm doing my math correct. So that's a lot of visits. So how were you able to get up there? Was it just producing a lot of content and it just started ranking or you guys have a strategy to it? Yeah. Well, knowing what I know about SEO now, I think that we did it poorly. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I think writing good articles, posting YouTube videos on the blog and on YouTube and, you know, kind of creating that, you know, the way that just kind of that symbiotic relationship where they're each feeding each other. I think that that really helped. There was a lot of word of mouth about kind of what we were doing because it was cool. We were in an RV. We were traveling around the country. We were like doing the American dream before we were retired, which is, you know, like it, it was a unique thing. And a lot of people were who were we interviewed they thought highly of what we're doing. So they would promote over. I recommend no one watch these videos. They're ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> this was like, day, this was like flip cam days. Right? So I mean, just, just don't go back, please. Like, 
<laughs> they're still up there as a repository. It's like to, I don't know, maybe if someone's taking that journey, maybe they can take it yeah. through us. But <laughs> how, how often were you like creating content or how, what was the frequency like per week? I was a video a day. Okay. Five days a week was what we were doing. And then I kind of got a little crazy and did a video and an article a day. And I think, I think the search engines dug that too. So I think that that's why, you know, we got a little bit more views, but I mean, I don't know if you want me to jump into kind of what I learned now based on the skincare, but we can talk about that later in terms of SEO, sure. but like, I don't, however you want to do that is fine. Yeah. We can talk more SEO, like current okay. strategies with that one. So that's cool. cool. But I mean, a big thing there was you're publishing frequently, you're getting really good content, you're going out and interviewing people, which just starts to create more like people are going to share that content on their own. And you guys have this big email list that you're pushing the content out to, and then they're sharing it out to their feed. So it's a lot of like this, you know, kind of like self, you know, cycling like content. Yeah. Yeah. And interviews, I mean, interviews always work. Like, I mean, you just think about, even you think about the history of TV, right? I mean, you can go back like Johnny Carson, you can go back to like, I mean, it always works. I mean, Oprah and now who else? Megyn Kelly. I mean, it's always working. It's always worked. And so just by association, you raise your level of credibility. And so that works all the time. Yeah. Very cool. So with this strategy, you're up to 150,000 visits a month. You have 60 to 80,000 person lists. You launch this store, you're sourcing your own products. How far did that take you revenue wise? So we, we got up over, over a million for two years in a row. And then the skincare business, we started it, I think probably the first year we hit, or no, or maybe actually before we hit a million, 2009, 2010-ish is kind of like where, where that time frame is. And that started to grow as Renegade Health was kind of like staying flat or sideways. And so as I started to see that grow, I was just like, wait a minute, there's something here that's a little bit bigger and different than this other business. Because what I learned fairly quickly, but not quickly enough, is that with the information business, you're selling pixels for the most part. And pixels are really cheap, you know, besides your hosting and your and your overhead with people or, you know, even if you have 1099 contractors, editors, things like that, like that cost is fairly fixed. And so, you know, you can sell with a huge margin, you know, depending on what you have, whether you have an ebook for 10 bucks or you have a course for $5,000, like the cost to fulfill on that is very small. And in many cases, the biggest thing that you pay for is the merchant fee, you know, which is 3%. And if you're lucky, it's lower. So, I mean, like that's kind of how you're, you're operating on the information business. The challenge with the information business is that you have to continually create new content in order to sell to the same customers. Because no one, unless they're completely computer illiterate, is going to buy two of your eBooks. You know what I mean? Like it's the same one. Yeah, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're going to buy one, and then they're done. They're not going to buy it again unless they forget, or you know, they're senile. I don't know. Uh, there's there's very few reasons for someone to do that unless they're buying it for a friend. But why would you buy it for a friend when you can just pass it on to them in an email? It just doesn't work in that way. The product business, which I liked and I learned a little bit from having a store and sourcing products from from different places is that this business, someone can buy the same thing every month. And you're just like, wow. So you spend all the time developing it, which is, which is an investment, right? Mm-hmm. It's an investment in time, money, people, resources, all that. But you only have to sell it. You only have to create it once and then it sells over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. And that to me was, was really awesome. I was like, wow, this is cool. I don't have to spend as much energy you know, in terms of my brain, like thinking about content all the time and constantly writing content, writing articles every day, doing videos every day, Mm. always feeling like the content wasn't enough because then people would actually just eventually, if they got bored of you, they would go on to someone else. Yeah. So that to me was, it's like a personal investment too. That's like a psychic kind of investment too. It's, It's a little bit different than a product. Yeah. It sounds kind of exhausting too. Yeah, it is. It is. And with a product, like if they don't like the product anymore, that's fine. You'll find someone else. It's a lot different, I think Mm -hmm. in that way. And there was a point probably 2011, 2012, where I was spending about 70% of my time on Renegade producing videos and doing articles and all that sort of stuff. And it was making about 30% of our gross you know, total revenues between the two businesses and about 30% of the skincare. And that was, you know, 66% of the business. And I was like, wait a minute, something's wrong here. (laughs) I'm not balancing out the risk versus reward kind of thing here. And so, you know, that's kind of when I went full on into the skincare business. It sounds pleasant. Everything sounds great. But the difference in a product business which I don't think anyone really realizes unless they've either done it before they're an accountant or someone told them is that it requires a significant amount of cash. Like, you know, your margins are much smaller 
particularly if you're producing high quality products and you can produce crap and, and still have really great margins, um, very similar to the margins of information business. But you know, then what are you adding to the world? But literally like it requires so much cash of so cash flow. Information business just spits off cash. It's just like, you know, you can just turn around and invest it. You can take some out, you know, you can have a salary with all that sort of stuff. The product business in the beginning, it was just like, wait a minute, what happened at the end of the year? You know, you say, <laughs> it says you have X amount of profit. So it says maybe you have like a hundred thousand dollars worth of profit, but you're like, there's like, you know, 20,000 in the bank. Yeah. Like, what does that mean? And you didn't even take any money. You didn't take any draws or anything like that, mm. but it's tied up in inventory. You know, and once you get to a certain point, you know, you have to use an accrual basis on inventory. So you pay taxes on it when you sell it, mm. you know, so it's pretty, you know, <laughs> it's intense. <laughs> yeah. We'll get back to the show in a minute, but first a quick thanks to our sponsor, Lead Quizzes. If you want to grow your business to seven figures and beyond, you must learn how to generate leads predictably. When I first started my business, lead generation felt like riding a roller coaster. I would have huge sales months and then months with nothing. This happened because I relied solely on referrals and networking to grow my business. Predicting growth and investing in the future were frightening because I didn't have control over my lead generation. That was before we created lead quizzes. Now I predictably generate leads in my sleep and have stopped worrying about where the next sale will come from. Top marketers like Neil Patel and Lewis House have used lead quizzes to increase their lead capture by up to 500%. Think about it. Quizzes are fun, engaging, and you can offer personalized feedback in exchange for your quiz taker's contact information. Lead Quizzes is a software that allows you to set up high converting quizzes quickly without having to hire an expensive programmer. In fact, our users have generated over 3 million leads for their businesses. Take control of your lead generation today and start your 14-day free trial by going to leadquizzes.com slash podcast. All right. So like, as we get into Anne Marie, just to recap some of this stuff. So you had a million dollars in 2010. So it took you about three years to get there with Renegade Health. Mm -hmm. I think so. it sounds like some of the reasons why you did it so quickly is you really leveraged partners. So a lot of people on our show yep. have, have leveraged partners if they don't have their audience already. And you relied really heavily on like content, which also started generating this traffic and just, it's just this like machine driving traffic and then people that could go to your store and buy these products you sourced. Yeah. I mean, it's like gravity really. I mean, if you think about just anything, like if you were to start a restaurant that you wanted it to be really popular, you wouldn't start it like in the middle of the country. You would probably start it in a city where there's people walking by mm -hmm. or in the internet. It's the same thing. It's like, go where the people are and bring some over to you. I've seen so many people fail by just not like accepting the fact that there are already other people in, in certain places. And if you kind of wedge up in there with the rest of them, someone will pay attention to you. I mean, Amazon's a perfect example, like, you know, sell your product on Amazon, you know, people are buying things there, right? I mean, it's just, and again, it takes a while to sometimes get those simple things. Like, mm -hmm. I will tell you that I've, you know, it sounds like, you know, know what I'm doing right now, but man, we just finally got on Amazon last year. So, I mean, you know, there's lots of things that, that you know, <laughs> mistakes that you can make. <laughs> but yeah, so. <laughs> Okay. So, I mean, you hit that pretty fast. Were there any moments in Renegade Health where you thought like, this is going to fail or, you know, like, why am I doing this? Oh yeah. I mean, all the time, all the business that we've ever done, there were times when we we're just like, oh man, like, where are we going to get this money? Usually that's the biggest question. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I think, and it sounds maybe a little bit woo woo, but just having the faith that it will work out and, you know, everything happens for the right reason, right time, right order, then it does work out. I mean, there, there's been weird times where we, particularly like the personal training is a perfect example. Like we had no money to pay our mortgage and we were just like, we were personal trainers. We just started with nothing, you know, no idea how we're going to pay our mortgage. It was like three days before we had to pay it. And we drove around, it's totally illegal. So don't do this, but we drove around to one of the richest neighborhoods in Connecticut and started putting flyers in everyone's mailboxes. It's illegal, but you know, whatever, <laughs> putting the flyers in. And we did 400 of them. You know, we probably spent, you know, $400 in gas, right? Yeah. <laughs> and we got zero response from those letters, right? <laughs> and then I come back to the house one day and there's an email in my inbox and it says, hey, you know, I want to meet with you about personal training. I get on the phone. We talked for about an hour. She had just moved into town, uh, hung up the phone, didn't know if I got the gig. An hour later, she called me back and she's like, hey, you know, I really appreciate you telling me all about the area here and I'm going to get married soon. I want to sign up for your thing. Can I pay you $2,000 in cash? I forget how many sessions it was, you know, like 20 sessions or something like that. And I was just like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, it just came from someone else, somewhere else. You know what I mean? It's just like the energy putting out brings energy back in. It just may not be from where you think it's going to come from. 
Very cool. All right. Well, let's transition into Anne Marie skincare. So what really inspired you guys to create this business? Well, we got mad. We were doing our store, uh, the Renegade Health store, Mm -hmm. and people were asking us about skincare products. And we said, sure, let's go look in our cabinet, see what we're using and see if we can recommend it. And what we found there was not up to like the kind of the purity of our diet and lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So we really just wanted to find, it's not a very sexy story. We really just wanted to find a product to sell in our store. And we started to explore the industry and we talked to people who created products. We talked to formulators. And what we started to find was that the industry wasn't as honest as we had really wanted it to be. And things like putting ingredients in products and not having to list them on the label because the Skincare Act of 1932 is outdated as you would think it would be. So we kind of got mad because we're just like, well, you know, if no one's really doing this in the way that we think that it should be done, we probably should figure out how to do it ourselves. And again, we talked to more formulators and we finally found a product that she really liked. And again, we were just like, great, we don't have to start a skincare business. We can just sell the product in our store. Contacted the owner and she said, no, I only sell to spas. And we're just like, oh man. (laughs) And about a week later, we're we're just like, hey, you know what? Maybe we should just do this. Maybe she wants to, to help us formulate one. And so we called her back and she said, yeah, that would be cool. And she's now a part owner in the business. So she's our formulator. She's been doing it now for with us since the beginning. So, but yeah, so that's how it started. And again, it really comes from the core belief that you can do this, you can do skin products, beauty products in the most natural way possible. And Mm -hmm. it'd be very easy for us to put certain preservatives in our products to keep them on the shelf longer or, or do this and that, but that's not the principle that we're operating out of. Okay, cool. So you found this formulator, this person that had already been making products that you guys loved, you guys felt like you could stand behind, you could share it with your audience that you'd build from Renegade Health. So you guys decided to like formulate it and start the business. So like, what was that like? You said it required a lot of capital to jump into a business like this. Yeah. Tell me about that. I wouldn't say the capital in the business in the beginning was that challenging because we were using capital from Renegade to then feed the skincare business. So mm-hmm. that was good. We we're taking those profits, reinvesting them. And, and, you know, if you look at, you know, how a business can grow and if you believe you can build your business, one of the best investments you can make. So we're putting money back in and we decided to launch zero market research, like absolutely, you know, no idea what we're doing. We decided to launch <laughs> two products that to this day are two of our worst selling. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> so, and they're fantastic products. They just don't sell a lot. And so we decided to launch these two products and the response was really nice. And we we're just like, wait a minute, maybe there is something here. And our philosophy or the strategy was to just take that money that we made from those products and reinvest it into another product. So instead of launching with like 10 products at first, we just slowly started to roll out new mm-hmm. products every time we had enough money to reinvest in, in a new product, in the inventory of a new product. Because the cool thing about having the formulator as a part owner was that we didn't have to pay for the upfront costs of developing a product, which mm-hmm. in the skincare industry can be $5,000, $10,000, dollars each product that you develop, depending on who you're going with. So mm-hmm. that's a steep barrier to entry up. I would not say to partner up with someone right away because that is also a steep barrier of exit. Um, <laughs> but, you know, but just think about creative ways to kind of work through capital issues. In that okay. Way. So I'm curious, you know, how did you figure out those two products you were going to create and then the next products after that? Well, you know, the first two, we just guessed. We were like, hey, maybe a Neroli spray and a mask. And that was, you know, people will buy masks all the time. They don't. I mean, in terms of like some of the other products that we have, <laughs> they like serums and facial oils, you know, and things yeah. like the body oils, moisturizers, cleansers, <laughs> you know, like those would have been great too. <laughs> but then we started a survey and then, okay. and then we started to get, to get into what people actually wanted. And to this day, we still survey. We survey people who, you know, purchase once and then, you know, never purchased again, just to see if there's any like outlying things. But I think mm-hmm. the most valuable survey that we do is when someone's purchased three times, we feel like they're pretty committed and we want to listen to, you know, very, very specifically to what their opinions are. And we get a lot of good data from that and turn around and use it to improve what we're doing. Okay, very cool. So like when we were talking, you said you did like a quarter million 2010, like about 600 in 2011, 2.25 in 2012. And you guys kept growing until you guys are at this eight figure run right now. But so like explain to me, like were the two products you guys rolled out, was that like your first year or... Did you start rolling out more products? Yeah, that was August 2009. So those came out and we may have launched a cleanser in that time period. And that was, I think we did 60 
like that with those two products and maybe a cleanser. And then, I mean, I wish I could tell you right now we're about 40 SKUs. So you probably can divide that by the number of years and pretty much tell how many we've launched each year, plus or minus, you know, one or two. Okay. Yeah. And it's been about eight years, right? Yeah. 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 Cool. So five, five ish a year, but it's pretty much, you know. Okay. So you got into a brand new business. I don't think you were in any kind of like product business like this before. So I'm sure there was a lot of learning curves. Like what did you guys figure out to be able to get past 60 K and get to the next benchmark? Well, I'm trying to think of what really propelled us was having a really good affiliate offer. And, you know, I talked to a lot of people about this, you know, when they're launching products and, and I wish that we had done this sooner. One, I wish we had done a little more market research to find out, you know, what people are buying the most. I mean, we just launched, you know, kind of to a mini list, uh, an essential oil diffuser and some essential oils. And this time we did the research and we're just like, what essential oils are people searching for? You know, mm-hmm. right? So like going straight SEO and being like, what do people really want? <laughs> yeah. So now we have, you know, frankincense, peppermint, you know, the oils that people are buying. Mm-hmm. So what I would have done is, is use some of those tools to determine what people were searching to find out what they wanted. And then I think we would have been a lot more aggressive on what offer we created. One of the things that I've always been, I wouldn't say a failure at, but something that I've been fairly awful at is sticking to one thing and improving that one thing over and over and over again. I think it's my, you know, quick start Colby, like shiny yep. thing, squirrel kind of like you know, behavior <laughs> mentality or, or just, you know, my wiring. And so what I wish we had done from the beginning is really just honed in on one product and really worked on the offer of that product. Like what's the best way to get that product into people's hands through affiliates, through Facebook, search engine traffic, all of that. And then just really start to sell that and then build the product line after that. So if I was to start a product business again, that's what I would do. I would pick one keystone or like, you know, centerpiece product and then build the product line after that offer was really strong. Hmm. And we eventually came up upon a good offer, which was a sample kit. We sold it for in a box for 10 bucks. I don't know if you've seen like the 23andMe box. It's very similar. I saw that and I was like, we need that. And so we have this like 23andMe box kind of thing. And we had, you know, open it up, you have three products in it. And that offer worked really well. It worked and it still works well to affiliates. So we use our network and this is where like the past thing came in is that we use our network of all the people that we had interviewed. And a lot of them had gotten a lot of great response from the summits that we did. And so they were more than willing to send for an offer that we had put together because it had converted for them when they did the interview. So that was really helpful. And the offer actually converted. And I think that's a big issue that people are dealing with. A lot of people, come, you know, in this space, you know, whether it's health or online or fitness or dating or, you know, whatever, all the different spaces that there are, is that a lot of people fail to test their offer first to determine what it actually gives to the affiliate in return, what the ROI mm-hmm. is or the cost per click. And they end up, you know, doing a launch and everyone's so excited about it. Everyone goes out and, you know, they make 10 cents per click. And they're just like, wait a minute, what happened? That wasn't worth my time to either write the email or send out the promotion. So having a really good offer, and I think over a dollar per click, you know, is a solid offer. That's great. Ours is two dollars. So like whole program wide over the last, you know, five or six years. So, so that's a solid offer for sure. All right. So that that sounds like it was a huge piece of it. So it's like the ten dollar sample kit is to get people in. Did you have like upsells in place that really made that profitable for them then? You know, what's crazy is that we actually, we're putting in upsells on that offer right now. So what we did, I know, it's, it's, it's amazing, right? <laughs> it's amazing that, we're, that I'm even where, where I am right now. <laughs> I'm living in a van by the river. <laughs> but no, I mean, we didn't need it because it was converting so well. So essentially what we did was we did 25% commission for six months. And we had a very specific email sequence after that went out over the period of, of 60 days. There's also a coupon. So they get a $10 sample kit, free shipping, and they get a $10 coupon to use for a future purchase. So if they like the product, then the sample kit was essentially free. And so that that has a lot of legs. And I recommend this to like anyone who's do like either talks to me or or wants to know like kind of like how to set up affiliate offer. I recommend anyone who has a product like this, you know, something you can actually put in your hands, a consumable good, is that you have some sort of sample offer like this because it really does gangbusters. Mm. Because people want to try it. Like whether if it's a supplement or if it's a food, It either has to make someone feel good right away or feel something right away, or it has to taste fantastic. If it doesn't have those two things, you're not going to get the legs, you know, and you're not going to get the long-term 
results. If it's a skin product, it needs to smell good and it needs to feel good on your skin right away. So those are like the two like checks. Like if you have a product right now, if it doesn't match those things, I wouldn't consider reformulating, but I might think about, you know, reformulating in the future (laughs) just because like, if you really want to make it work, good product can make up for like crappy marketing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. So, I mean, that's really good advice. And then you guys did this 25% commission on that $10 $10 and then six months. So you guys would follow up with people. You continue to sell them products, try to get them to continue to buy from you guys. Yeah. And that worked really good. And then, so you said that was one funnel you guys really dialed in. And then you said that you guys started getting into like Facebook and SEO. And so that's helped you guys grow a lot as well. Yeah. So what also has helped us grow, I mean, you know, we really relied heavily on the affiliates up until one and a half, two years ago. So how far did that take you guys just in revenue, just for perspective? I'd say that probably took us, you know, somewhere between six and seven. Okay. Six and seven million. And then what we started to do is as email deliverability starts to become a thing of, you know, our decade now, the end of this decade, as just the overflow of emails in people's inboxes, we knew that we had to switch up some of the things that we were doing and some of the affiliate traffic started to you know, decline a little bit. Mm-hmm. And it's a market size thing too. Like, you know, a lot of things we're doing is natural health. So like, you know, there is a point where you kind of you don't hit the end of it, but you know, you do get some diminishing returns. So we started to focus on SEO. And at that time, when we started focusing on SEO, literally same as Renegade Health, I don't know what our developer was doing, but like literally we were the same, like Renegade Health, maybe like five or 6K a day. And Marie, we were about 4K a day. And we were writing regular blog posts. We learned pretty early that we shouldn't write just skincare blog posts because skincare is like a secondary product to like the main issue, which is, you know, longevity, looking good, feeling good, health, fitness. So we started writing skin blogs and like no one would come to the site. And then we would write articles about coconut oil and like people would just like, you know, they would blow up. So we realized that we wanted to be more of a lifestyle brand than just a skin brand. And so we had gained a lot of traffic just by writing interesting articles about interesting things. But again, we were capped at that 4,000 point. We hired an SEO consultant to come in and work with us And man, within like six months, like he had tripled our SEO traffic Mm. and he'd done some really simple things, like things that I can tell you now that you may or may not know about that are really super valuable, but really easy to do. You know, some of the things where we have a WordPress blog and some of the things where he really worked to recategorize everything. So it was really only in a couple categories. So, you know, no more than 10 that were very specific on the keywords that we were focused on, right? I mean, it sounds really easy. But a lot of people are writing, creating multiple categories, and they're essentially diluting the power of, you know, whatever kind of category you have. So if you continue to add, you know, it's it's the silo effect where, you know, if you have organic skincare and you have 20 articles on organic skincare in there, the search engines give you a lot more juice. Sure. The other thing that we did was he no followed all of the tags, all the tag pages, because when you tag like a WordPress blog and you come up with random tags, you may think that you're doing like the user a favor but you're actually telling the search engine that you have a ton of pages that really suck. And so if you have a tag for skin, it's like you have, let's see, lavender, and you only have one article on lavender, but you have like 100 tags and all these other 100 tags have one article, that's 100 crappy pages that you have on your site that the search engines are like, this is a bad page. So that brings down the entire credibility of your site. So we did that as well as well as putting some keywords on the homepage and like just some regular stuff. As of now, we get over 30,000, you know, organic visits a day. And that 4,000 was organic as well. So we got over 30,000 organic visits a day. We have more because of some of the other traffic that's coming from us, but that's in about a year and a half, maybe two years. That's kind of the growth that we've experienced from a skincare product site. You know what I mean? It's not even like if you have something that's very specific and you're writing about IBS or you're writing about, you can name it, but I mean, like even membership sites, right? I mean, or quizzes, you can just totally hone in on that and you can get tons of traffic, particularly, you know, really high quality traffic. The other thing that we did, thanks to your software, was we set up a quiz that started to work really well. We started to capture the traffic that was coming to the site. (laughs) Surprise! (laughs) And put them through a quiz that gave them some recommendations on their skin type and what products they should use. And yeah, we've got a lot of leads. I mean, we're up to 30, 40,000 leads a month from our quiz. We're revamping it now. There's some things that I'd like to do to change kind of the tone around it and the information and how we present the things. But it's definitely something that we're actively looking at as a huge 
lead source and as well as a revenue generator for our business. But I think it was a big deal and we can highlight that real quick and we got to wrap up. But Mm -hmm. I mean, you generate a lot of traffic with SEO. The next thing was like, how can I capture more leads? So you put a good quiz in place that was engaging. It was like, what's your skin score? And then at the end, like at least when you first launched this, it led into that offer that converted, which was like the sample kit. Yeah. And so for you guys, you guys at the time added over, I believe, 10,000 leads a month and an additional $100,000 in revenue from putting that funnel in place. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I mean, like the tribute, like you said, is like really finding one specific funnel and one offer and like making that work and compelling offer. Yeah, it's so much easier. I mean, if you're the type who gets bored, you have to know that and you have to find someone who can work on the one thing. So I mean, that's like the caveat. You can still you know do the thing if you are the person who jumps over all over the place, but find someone who can manage that one thing, yeah. whether it's a VA or if it's, I mean, who knows, it's a conversion optimization specialist, it's another contractor, but find someone to run that one thing and work on it and tweak it. And you will eventually get success as long as the product doesn't suck, as long as it's a good product. Very cool. Well, <laughs> Kevin, I feel like this interview has flown by. Just a few quick questions that we'll go through at the end. Yeah. Number one, what's one thing that you guys did that you think had the biggest impact on your growth? The sample kit offer. Okay. And so for our listeners, maybe that's just figuring out what your compelling offer is that's going to convert. And stick with it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Next question. If you could go back in time and start over, what would you tell yourself? (laughs) (laughs) I would tell myself that there are a lot of ups and downs and keep some chocolate by your desk and, you know, (laughs) just don't drink too much coffee and (laughs) and get out and exercise a bit when you're feeling stressed because it will come back around. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, cool. Kevin, like you have an amazing story. What's next for you guys? Oh, what's next is just to continue to grow this fun business. You know, we have a team here of 20 plus people now and we're excited this year for some new growth, for some more, you know, some new offers, some more Facebook and Google traffic that we're really working on, honing in on. So we're just excited to get this product out to people for sure. Very cool. Well, Kevin, like if people want to learn more about you, like where can they find you and connect with you? Yeah. If you want to connect with me, you can go to kevingiani.com. From there, you can go to the skincare site. You can send me an email or something, whatever you want to do. That's the best place to start. Okay, awesome. All right, well, that sounds good. We'll link that stuff up in the show notes. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us. I've been looking forward to this interview for a while and it was super, super valuable. I know our listeners are going to love it. Awesome, man. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks again for listening to our show this week. If you want to find out more about Kevin Gianni and the lessons he shared today or read our show notes, visit leadquizzes.com slash six. If you'd like to start generating more leads for your business and get a free trial to Lead Quizzes, go to leadquizzes.com slash podcast. Next week, I'll be interviewing Veronique James on how she went from $250,000 in debt and not being able to afford gas for her car to building a $4 million full-service digital agency. Please subscribe to our show so you don't miss this next episode. I'm Jeremy Ellens, and you've been listening to Journey to Seven Figures.